Tonight, we are paying tribute to John Lennon, who was murdered this morning outside his New York apartment. We'll be hearing from people who knew him in the early days in Liverpool, during the height of his fame as a member of the Beatles, and in the last few years when he lived as a recluse in New York. And we'll also be paying tribute to John Lennon, the musician, who formed, surely, the most successful pop group the world has ever seen. It really did set the world by the ears. And this is how it sounds. Throughout the day, hundreds of John Lennon fans have been gathering outside the New York apartment building where he was shot dead at four o'clock this morning. Many of them carried lighted candles and flowers. Others were screaming hysterically. John Winston Lennon was born in Liverpool in 1940. And while still at school, he was responsible for forming the group that was to become the Beatles. In 1956, John Lennon, Paul McCartney and George Harrison were playing skiffle sessions. They then became known as the Quarry Men and then the Silver Beatles. But their fame as a group only began to spread when they started playing regular sessions at Liverpool's Cavern Club. Their first record, Love Me Do, was a typical John Lennon composition. It entered the chart in December 1962 and reached number 17. Then followed Please Please Me, From Me to You, and their biggest selling record, She Loves You. By 64, Beatlemania had swept the world. Well, with a bitter irony, just 48 hours after recording that interview with Andy Peebles of Radio 1, John Lennon was shot dead in the street. Andy, he sounded from your interview in, on Saturday as if he was in great spirits, was he? Yes, I think he was. I mean, as somebody who'd never met the man before and has always had him very much at the top, if not at the top of the list of people that I would like to interview, um, I found John Lennon, the man who'd been away from all of us for five or six years, in a fantastic spirit and a great frame of mind, and willing to talk about every part of his career, going right back to the early days of the Quarry Men and the original name of the Beatles, through the Beatles era, through his era with Yoko Ono, through the work he'd done with her. So there were no holds barred in the interview? No, none at all, none at all. I mean, the conversation went all over the place during the course of our three and a bit hours interview and our dinner. We went out for dinner afterwards. But what sort of things did he talk to you about personally when the tape recorder wasn't switched on? I mean, was he interested, for instance, about life in Britain today? Oh, yes. I mean, at one stage in the interview uh, and also off mic, he was talking about Liverpool with great affection. In fact, Yoko was teasing him to a great extent about his love for Liverpool and telling me that when he read articles in the British newspapers, apparently he took The Guardian on a daily basis, um, he would get very, very emotional about the old home country. W what did he look like physically? Does he look like that these days? No, he didn't look like that. Very definitely not like that. He's a lot, lot thinner. And he was wearing a pair of fairly thick glasses with pinkish rims. Uh, he had a tight-fitting sweater on and a pair of jeans and a silver jacket with fur trim, and he looked every bit the pop star, I must say. Now, why this new album at, at this stage? Well, is it part, well, had it been his intention to make a comeback? Yes, I think it had, but he wanted to do it when he wanted to do it, and not when other people dictated it to him. I mean, one must appreciate here that the Beatles went through endless management hassles, and that the pressure showed, particularly with John Lennon, who fought against it, um, he was the politics, I think, behind the Beatles. He was the sense of humour. And I think probably, and this is only a personal assessment, John Lennon would have found the politics and the management situation more offensive than anybody else. And I think that was probably the initial reason for him wanting to quit. So when he came back, the timing had to be absolutely right and the environment had to be right as well. But was he also on the point of, of ending that part of his life that was the recluse, that shut himself away from the rest of humanity? Did he want to start life, really? Afresh. Well, of course, John would, would say, God bless him, if he was still here, but he never changed his life that radically. He reversed roles with his wife. She became the business manager. He became, and he said this to me in the interview, the husband, or rather the housewife, both at the same time. And it brought him incredibly close to his young son, Sean, which makes the events of the last 24 hours even more tragic, because he talked with such love and affection about the, the bond and the union between himself and his son. You got off the aeroplane this morning, having just returned from the interview. How did you feel when they told you the news? The realization that John Lennon, who I'd interviewed on Saturday night in New York, had died while I was flying over the Atlantic was a shattering experience. Andy people, thank you very much. Let's uh, just end with another clip from your interview. One final question. How sadly wrong he was. Hugh Scully talking to Andy Peebles there, the last man to interview John Lennon. And somebody else has been talking about John Lennon too, somebody who knew him long before he became famous and found him a somewhat difficult person to deal with, his former headmaster in the city of Liverpool. Mr. Popjoy, what uh, are your memories of John Lennon? What sort of pupil was he? It is 25 years ago since I knew him, but uh, when I first arrived at school, my first year, his last, by great coincidence, uh, he had been a very great problem 
he was intractable, and by his own account, which I think is truthful, he had been intractable right through junior school and grammar school. So how did you control him? I don't think anyone did control him. Uh, in those days, I resorted, in his case once only, to resort to corporal punishment, uh, in which I no longer believe. Uh, that didn't work, and uh, Hunter Davis, in his biography, points out that I fairly soon came to the conclusion that one must treat John in a different way. Despite this being intractable, did you like him? I was certainly very interested in him. To me, of course, he was an acute problem, an acute problem to all my colleagues. Did he show, uh, at that age, any musical skills? Very considerable. One of his interests, though not his greatest interest, uh, was his skiffle group, which he formed from uh, Quarry Bank Boys, which he called the Quarry Men. In those days, he used to come and humbly ask permission to play in the intervals of the school dance. And I would give it uh, mature consideration and then perhaps somewhat reluctantly say, yes, he might. He performed free of charge. There was nothing mercenary in John Lennon's nature in those days. When Beatlemania spread, uh, other groups wanted to charge exorbitant amounts for playing in their own school, but not John. What were his other interests at school? In the interest which he listed, uh, I think he put salmon fishing first. And after that, painting and poster making. He had a great variety of interests. Did you regard him then as an extraordinary character? Well, he was quite out of the ordinary. His uh, life story, which he's told himself, and which others have told, shows him to have been quite extraordinary. What was your reaction to this morning's news? I was shocked, as I would be at any violent act. I was very surprised, but on reflection, uh, I can't see John Lennon opting for the sear and yellow. Uh, I don't think he would have had any admiration for merely living steadily into old age. Mr. Popjoy, thank you very much.